right, good morning. Welcome to our science seminar for today. Um, hope you're having a, a good day. I'm educating this. Okay, I want to remind you before I introduce our speaker for today that next week we have with us um, Susan Bratton from the Department of Environmental Sciences of Baylor, and she's going to be speaking on Christian responses to the topic of global climate change. So if you have interest in um, that topic, right, you want to come out for that. That should be an exciting one. Okay. And then in October, October 2nd, so two weeks from today, we have another sort of exciting seminar on origins, sort of a book ending our first seminar with um, Bob Hausman, who talked about the age of the earth. Now we're going to have another geologist, also from Baylor, chair of the department over there, who's going to talk about the... Um, consequences to our faith with respect to how we deal with the age of the earth. So that should be very interesting. Two interesting seminars coming up in the next couple of weeks that I'm sure that you will want to be here for. And today we have a very exciting seminar on something we're all well aware of. Yes, that is chocolate. Okay. And if you were here last night for the um, ATS meeting, you we had a, a wonderful talk on small businesses and chemistry. That was very informative and interesting to hear about. And I'm sure we'll hear more about interesting things today. Our speaker today comes through the American Chemical Society. They send out speakers to the local chapters. And so they only send out the best. So you can <laughs> be assured today that you're getting one of the best speakers around in the area of chocolate and chemistry. She received her BS degree, I believe, from LSU, Louisiana yes. State University. And she also received a master's in science from Ohio State. And she has her own company called, what is it, B? B Labs. B Labs. Yep, yep. And you can bet that it's named after her her name here, Vershalati. Is that yes. how you say that? And my maiden name was Verges. So, oh, so we, we have two Bs. Okay. <laughs> So I want to remind you that if you're interested in small businesses, if you're interested in chocolate, if you're interested in chemistry, if you just want to hear and talk to the speaker some more, we will be having lunch in the Joyce Room at the Corner Cafe. So take advantage of this opportunity to meet with someone outside of Laterno who you may never see again, and you know, just get to know her, learn from her experiences, that's all part of the seminar experience. And I'll take advantage of that. And that's it. Let's give our speaker a warm welcome. Well, thank you so very much for inviting me here today. It's an honor and a privilege. And I want to compliment you on such a beautiful university facility. Um, it, it's been lovely just walking through the campus and seeing what beautiful buildings there are and also what beautiful students there are. So, um, and I thank you for coming today. And we're talking about chocolate, food of the gods and lovers. Uh, first off, we, we have a comment from a noted um, uh, character, Lucy Van Pelt. We're familiar with her from Charlie Brown. And Lucy says, all I really need is love, but a little chocolate now and then can't hurt. So uh, I, I think that's a good philosophy. Um, and we do have bits of chocolate that uh, you know, can't hurt. Now, um, I'll begin with the history of chocolate. The, uh, from uh, 1500 BC to 400 BC, the Olmec Indians, down here, um, the southern end of Mexico, not Mexico then, uh, the Olmec Indians grew cocoa beans as a domestic crop. And this was an exceedingly valuable domestic crop. Um, well, the cocoa beans were traded for turquoise. So the cocoa beans were as valuable as jewels. And, uh, and the turquoise came 
1,400 miles north, up here um, toward the current Mexican border, and there was travel back and forth on trade of cocoa beans and turquoise. The um, Indian, the Aztec emperor, Montezuma II, who was the emperor uh, who lived from 1466 to 1520, drank 50 goblets of cocoa a day. I think that's a little bit too much. But in 1519, Montezuma II um, served chocolate to uh, Cortez, the explorer from Spain. And Cortez um, certainly enjoyed the cocoa, and it, cocoa was not available in any of Europe. Um, so he brought, Cortez brought chocolate to Spain in 1529. So it was a long, long voyage from here, over here to Spain. And gradually, uh, from let's say roughly 1615, the use of cocoa spread throughout Europe, over toward east, toward Italy, moving forward, 1659, France, uh, 1657 um, to the Great, Great Britain, and up to Sweden. So it, it took you know, a good long time to get through Europe, but it became very popular in Europe as well. And we have 1765. This is Baker's chocolate. That's the Baker's chocolate that we cook with, the little squares of uh, unsweetened chocolate. And this is Walter Baker and Company um, from Dorchester, Dorchester, Massachusetts. And the first line is, no chemicals are used in the manufacture. And um, having no chemicals in chocolate is one of those things that irritates me a lot. At the farmer's market in our town, the vegetable lady has worked, well, I've worked on convincing that the vegetable lady has chemicals in her vegetables. And she doesn't want to believe it, but, you know, it's the chemicals are what we are furniture, us, the vegetables. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, so this is the baker's chocolate from uh, an ad from the Fannie Merritt Farmer Boston Cooking School, the cookbook from 1896. <coughs> Hieronimo Piperni in 1796 said, chocolate is a divine celestial drink, the sweat of the stars, the vital seed, divine nectar, the drink of the gods, panacea, and universal medicine. Many applications. Now, um, a noted maker of chocolate is Kaye, and Kaye is sold, sold in the United States even, even now. It began in um, 18, 1819 in Switzerland, Francois Louis, Louis Caillet, he was the first one who added sugars. So all of that previous uh, consumption of cocoa was the bitter cocoa. And not till 1819 was sugar ever added. And he was the first one to make commercial eating chocolate. And in Holland, the Van Houtens also sold cocoa. Uh, they were in, uh, began in Holland in 1828, and Casparus von Houten invented the cocoa press. And in a, in a few slides later, we'll have the cocoa press, a big, heavy piece of machinery that cracked, cracked the cocoa beans and made very fine particles of them. Uh, his son, <coughs> Conrad van Houten, uh, developed the alkali process, and it's often called the dutching process, and that separates the, the fats from the rest of the material in the cocoa. Now, um, in 1875, the Swiss 
uh, man, Daniel Peter, introduced milk solids to chocolate, along with Henry Nestle, and we know less of Nestle in the United States. And he had invented condensed milk. So they put the condensed milk into the chocolate and uh, made uh, what we know it is sweetened milk chocolate. And an ad from uh, Peter's company, smooth, smooth, pure, creamy. The original chocolate, the original milk chocolate, irresistibly delicious. So we brought you one, one small piece of milk chocolate that you probably know already. Um, now, in Switzerland, in 1879, Robert Lent made the conching machine. And that's reducing the particle size if you put the beans in the conching machine and the cocoa becomes smoother. Creamy gives you that melt-in-the-mouth effect. And here's the conching machine. These can be very large machines. And these um, rollers here, the, the uh, brace here turns in a circle, and then the rollers go round and round in addition to going round and round the other way. So they make the circle and turn at the same time. And the cocoa particles, you know, stick, fall off, but they run it until the particles are very, very fine. Um, the French gastronome, Briand Savarin, said chocolate is health. He drank 12 cups per day, and he prescribed it for many ills, from lethargies to hangovers. Keep it in mind. <laughs> now, um, now, I'd just like to talk about the taxonomy, how, how the uh, cocoa was named. It was named by the Swedish botan, botanist Carolus, Carolus Linnaeus, and he developed the um, codification of um, plants. Uh, and the word uh, theobromo cacao, theo comes from theos, which means of the gods. Roma means food or aroma. So it's, um, you can call co uh, chocolate the food of the, the divine drink, the food of the gods. Now, where is cocoa produced? Uh, the largest producer of cocoa is the um, Cote d'Ivoire, the Ivory Coast in Africa. And they produce 38% of the cocoa in the world. The next highest percent is 21 in Ghana, also in Africa. So Africa um, has uh, the great majority of cocoa production. Um, next comes Indonesia, and then um, some Central American countries and Middle Eastern countries. So a little bit about cocoa. There are five to six million cocoa farmers in the world. There are 40 to 50 million people who depend, whose livelihoods depend on cocoa. The annual production of cocoa is about three million tons. And over the past hundred years, there's been a 3% increase in demand for cocoa every year. So cocoa usage has grown and grown and grown. The current global market value of cocoa is $5.1 billion annually. Now, we know now where it came from, now we want to know who eats it. And anybody hazard a guess there? <laughs> the United States uh, citizens consume 32% of the chocolate in the world. Next comes Germany, France, uh, Germany with 11%, you know, just one third of what the US eats. France, United Kingdom, 
the um, Russian Federation, and then much smaller amounts by the rest of Europe. Canada, I, I actually was surprised that Canada only ate 2.6%, I mean, compared to the United States. And then uh, Central, Central South America, and so on. Well, didn't want to do that. Oh, really didn't want to do that. Okay. Now, where do you go to slideshow? Resume slideshow. Sorry, I missed you up. Right there? Yeah. Oh, thank you, thank you. All right. Um, so we finished with the consumption of chocolate. And uh, I wanted to show you a cocoa tree. How, how does it grow? Um, we can start right here at the bottom of the tree. The, the branch coming out is called a sucker or choupon. Um, if any of you grow things at home, if, uh, we use the word suckers as well. And those are parts of the tree that you don't want to be there and they cut that off because they just take energy and content away. Um, the flowers grow on the, on the trunk and on the branches. And um, the um, pods also grow on the branches. And here's an actual cocoa tree. It grows 20 to 30 feet high. Hey, the pods, there are about <coughs> 20 to 30 pods on a tree, and the pods are eight by four inches, kind of large, and there are 30 to 40 uh, seeds per pod, and the seeds are what, what we eat. And what are the uh, most prevalent cacao types of trees? Um, Criollo is, uh, has exceptional flavor and aroma. It's less than 15% of the world's um, cocoa, and most of it grows in Central America and the Caribbean. So um, if, if you're visiting in Central America and Caribbean, see if you can find some. Uh, it probably tastes a lot better than what we get in the United States. The Forastero is uh, a plentiful variety of high quality Brazil and African uh, cocoa. And it's hardier, more productive, and easier to cultivate. And it's widely used. It's 70 to 80 percent of the world's supply. And Trinitario originated in Trinidad, and it's a cross between the Criollo and the Fosteria. And uh, it's uh, about 10 to 15 percent of the world's supply. And here's a picture of the cocoa flowers. And they're on the side of the tree. And any uh, flowers or fruit that grows on the stem and, or on the trunk, the word it's called is cauliflory. And the cocoa flowers are about a half inch in size. They're very, very small. And only 5% of the flowers yield fruit. And um, this kind of tree uh, is similar to the redbud tree in the United States. But I, I don't think we have the redbud tree this far south. I know we had redbud in Virginia when we lived there. But I don't remember seeing one this far south. I'm from Louisiana. Um, and here's the pod. The large ones in the front are the uh, ripened pod. And the ones in the back, the purple, the little ones, are called chorelles. So those are the not fully developed uh, cocoa pods. And you can see they're, they're on the branches. And if you cut the um, pod in half, in the center are the seeds, and this is what we make the cocoa from. But first, the outside has to be discarded, and then the um, white material that co holds it together also has to be removed. Um, so after the harvest of the cocoa, the, the cocoa is first dehusked. That big outside part is taken off, and then fermentation begins. 
And the cocoa beans are fermented from two to six days. And they're uh, covered with banana leaves um, initially. And they don't do that as much anymore. But uh, the heap was covered with banana leaves. Right now, they use big boxes with holes or screens in the bottom. And they're dried, sorted, and cleaned. Um, this is uh, a picture of the, the, the seeds with the banana leaves on top and bottom, and the fermentation begins in there. So the yeast phase, which is the beginning phase of the fermentation, alcohol forms, and then that white pulp we talked about, you had to get rid of that, it liquefies. And then the germ of the cotyledon of the seed um, dies. After that yeast phase dies out, uh, a bacterial phase of fermentation continues, and it's an acetic fermentation, an acid fermentation, like vinegar, like acetic acid is, is vinegar. And in that process, heat is evolved. It gets up to 122 degrees Fahrenheit. So the oil and flavor develops in the beans, the brown color develops, but it results in a 15% loss of weight. And then the beans are dried, which in, in total is a 35 to 40% loss of weight. And here's a picture of um, the commercial drying of the beans. So we're going to review the manufacture of the chocolate. Uh, we begin with roasting the beans, and then uh, the roasted beans are cracked and um, shaken. And then finally the nibs, which is separated out, are ground, and they make cocoa liquor. So it's a liquid, a very dense liquid with lots of solid in it. The cocoa liquor is then pressed, and we get the cocoa powder that we spoke of earlier, and the cocoa butter. Um, the manufacturer then, we can look at sweetened chocolate, the dark chocolate. We take the cocoa liquor, mix it with cocoa butter that we just separated it from, but the proportions can be controlled, and sugar is added. And this whole mixture goes back through that conching process, that big wheel that turns round and round. And so they're very thoroughly mixed, and they make chocolate. This is dark chocolate. Next um, is the manufacture of milk chocolate, the Nestle process. We have chocolate liquor, cocoa butter, powdered cond condensed milk, so it's, it's sweetened milk and well as sugar. And again, this is conched, and we uh, have the milk chocolate. And if, if you haven't uh, tasted your samples, now would be a good time to taste your samples. You, you have uh, the, the nibs in there, and, uh, and then the uh, small chocolate bars we had. And then the cocoa powder. The cocoa powder is just like what you buy at the store. And as you go out, after tasting your chocolate, uh, please feel free to bring a few samples with you. So, so, uh, so do you have any comments about the, the, the cocoa and just how bitter that is <laughs> compared to the actual chocolate? Yeah, I, I see your mouth going, and it does that to you. <laughs> So when we get to, you know, milk chocolate, um, whoops. I go backwards? No, that's not backwards. Okay, so I, I just wanted to um, 
uh, talk about the particle size. We talked about conching the chocolate. And the particle size uh, increases the flavor volatiles. That is, it makes more surface on the cocoa. And so, um, champagne. <laughs> I didn't expect that. <laughs> um, the, uh, the flavor volatiles are, the, the particle size are between 18 and 25 microns. <coughs> And the flavor volatiles increase as the particles grow smaller. And what you can um, detect is the cocoa odor, chocolate, and proline flavors. And these are things that you smell. And also caramel, sweet, and honey. Um, so much of what we view as taste is really aroma. Um, if we like maybe you've noticed if you get a bad cold and you can't can't breathe, nothing tastes good. It's just because you can't smell anything. And you know, probably more than fifty percent of your detection is, is with your nose. Now we can talk about the chemicals because uh, that are present in in the flavor and chemistry of the chocolate, the cocoa, cooked and roasted. Um, and we have to talk about the chemistry because I'm a chemist and we're in the chemistry building. And so. But um, the, base, uh, the basic unit in, in the chemicals that we have listed here are pyrazines. And it's a six-membered ring containing two nitrogens. The su substituents are methyl, which is CH3, or ethyl. CH3, CH2. So the first compound, tri uh, trimethylpyrazine, so that would be like one, two, three methyl groups on the molecule. And the aroma that you perceive with this is cocoa roasted and cooked. And flavor chemists um, study this a great deal, no matter it, um, the flavor of whatever. But these volatile materials is what we sense. And this is really important in uh, the food industry, in manufacturing of food. Um, next, we have dimethyl, 2,3-dimethylpyrazine. And if we count down from the nitrogen, uh, one, two, three. Two and three, we would have two methyls. <clears throat> That's cooked and nutty. 2,5-dimethyl, this would be two. 5-dimethyl, and that change in position alters the flavor. And uh, flavor chemists study uh, these chemical structures as they relate to um, the uh, as they relate to the flavors. Uh, we can go on to tetramethylpyrazine. All four marks, all four positions are occupied by the methyl group. And then uh, this one, 2,3-diethyl, and the ethyl is CH3CH2, so it's a little bit longer substituent, 5-methyl. So 2, 3, 5 is the ethyl group. And that flavor is cocoa, cocoa chocolate that we recognize. And linalool oxide is the citrus flavor, and that's a minor component in... Um, in the chocolate flavor. And you have to practice to be able to detect the differences between this. And people who study flavor um, professionally are really experts. And um, you know, if you enjoy tasting things, you might consider this as a career. Of course, it's not always about chocolate. Uh, we can go on with, with more flavor chemistry. There's caramel-like sweet and honey flavors. And these are more complex, 2,3,5,6-ethylpyrazine. Um, so it's substituted all the way around. Uh, there's a parole that gives honey candy. And that's in, uh, at a low level. Uh, 2-phenylethanol, caramel-like sweet honey. 
and chocolate odor is 3-methylbutanol. So as you learn more and more about the chemistry of flavor, you can learn to identify these components that give these, these flavors, and that's, that's very important. Um, the acetic acid flavor is sour, and that's vinegar. Uh, vinegar is essentially acetic acid. Now, um, fat, uh, the fat content alters the perceived volatile flavor components. And so as the, fi the fat concentration increases or decreases, you can change the flavor or the flavor volatiles. And um, so <clears throat> you can, uh, cocoa is in the range of 20 to 25 to 35% uh, fat. And the flavor volatiles in the fat are cocoa, chocolate, praline, a favorite uh, coming from Louisiana. This is one of our favorite candies. Fruity and roasted, all of those are increased in flavor. The ones, flavors that are decreased are caramel, sweet, and honey. <coughs> now there are also alkaloids. These are more complex molecules that are in cocoa beans. Um, they range from theobromine, caffeine, to theophylline. Um, the theophylline is, is used as a decongestant. Uh, the theobromine is, is a, a weak stimulant compared to caffeine. And then there are also antioxidants in cocoa, and um, they represent um, 12 to 18 percent of the nibs are antioxidants or polyphenols, and they reduce inflammation. So these are positive effects of cocoa. <coughs> and these include the flavanol here, and the more complex molecules, the epicatechins. So if we summarize, I, I know most of you know that um, dogs can't eat chocolate. They're toxic to dogs. So they ask, what's so great about a dog's life? You can't even eat chocolate. Um, I see the point. Now, uh, we're, we're talking about and what all those things that chocolate do for us, uh, does for us. Melting chocolate in one's mouth increases brain activity and the heart rate. It's more intense than passionate kissing. And right here, this painting is uh, Gustav Klimt, The Kiss. And the effect lasts four times as long after the activity is ended. So I, could, I don't know whether you'd rather eat chocolate than kiss. I, I wouldn't be the, here to judge. <laughs> but just know it doesn't last as long as eating chocolate. <coughs> and then the effects on health, just a general summary. Um, in the res respiratory system, it's a cough suppressant. There's a danger in the systemically of obesity. Intestinally, uh, diarrhea is inhibited. In the circulatory system, especially dark chocolate, there's reduced blood pressure, um, facilitated dilation, and decreased rate of infarction. So if you want to prevent a heart attack, chocolate is there for you. Um, now, there are dangers. There's dangers of addiction. Uh, and there's a risk of lead poisoning, although I think that risk has declined enormously um, with the current FDA rules. So, so, people have asked for a long time in our early discussion, is, is chocolate an aphrodisiac? And um, so we will take a look. First, it has phenylethylamine in it, which induce feelings of attraction, excitement, and giddiness. Oh, and I neglected to say, this is Andy Warhol's uh, painting. That's 
<laughs> Some people have questions. You're not the only one uh, the, about whether this is art. Um, uh, tryptophan is also uh, present, and it's a precursor of serotonin, which uh, makes us feel sleepy, but also gives us feelings of elation. And, and anandamide in the chocolate, it binds to the cannabinoid receptors in the brain. So it has properties that are similar to uh, cannabis, <coughs> which brings a heightened sensitivity, a euphoria, and a sense of well-being. <coughs> So overall, the effects of chocolate, I have this theory that chocolate slows down the aging process. It may not be true, but do I dare take the chance? Thank you very much. Well, I think we have some time for questions for our, our guests, either of our business or of our chocolate. The cocoa powder is removed, uh, so that's the dark color, the cocoa powder, and then we're left with the cocoa fat. And so it has a lesser chocolate flavor than, than the regular chocolate, but it still has a, a good flavor that we enjoy eating. Any other questions? Oh, hi. Hi. I was comparing the structure of theobromine to, like, say, adenine, which is in our DNA. Do you think you could, like, switch the two and have, like, DNA composed of chocolate then? <laughs> <laughs> Maybe I could submit that as a proposal to the National Institutes of Health. <laughs> Anyone else with a question? Yes? yes? I'm curious. It looks like most of the production now is in Africa, but originally the plants were in South America. Were they intentionally in exported to Africa and imported into Africa? Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, that raises a question about the ethics of chocolate. We see <laughs> lots of things out there on websites about how people are taken advantage of in the chocolate industry, how there's child slave labor and things like that. Do you have any comments? That and ethical to eat mm. I actually don't know a whole lot about the child labor being used, but um, I think it's important to support the industry. So uh, <clears throat> I would urge you to eat more. <laughs> so, uh, any more questions? Well, I invite you to. Uh, just take any samples you like as you depart. I, I can't bring them home.